535 we are live now sir we are live okay on youtube yes sir all right 535 yes sir so um, yeah good evening everyone uh, and welcome to the sitara weekly seminar series uh, i'll just give a brief introduction because we perhaps have people from outside sitara and maybe outside iitb that are also joining us uh, uh, my name is pankaj sikharia i am faculty at the center for technology alternatives for rural areas a small interdisciplinary group at iit bombay that as the name suggests works at the interface of technology development uh, largely focused on rural areas uh, we do a weekly seminar series in which we have a whole range of invited speakers who come and speak on a range of topics uh, that is then uh, goes out to the iit community but we also try and reach out more widely so it's it's being live streamed on youtube and we do have a few people who've joined there so thanks everybody for joining and welcome uh, i'll just uh, briefly very briefly introduce our speaker today a more in an informal note uh, so we have uh, dr geeta ramaswamy of the nature conservation foundation who's going to be speaking to us about uh, climate change uh, studying climate change through trees and using this very new and interesting kind of methodology if one might argue that way of citizen science i have personally had the interaction and opportunity of interacting with geeta over the last 3 4 years now on multiple projects on multiple uh, uh, avenues and i won't hesitate to say that the project that she's going to talk about and the work that they have been doing is absolutely amazing and even from a citizen science education and from a science perspective i think it's uh, there's a lot of lot for us to learn from this so Uh, thank you so much geeta uh, on behalf of uh, sitara our head anand is here and my colleague priya who coordinates our uh, sitara seminar series on her behalf too i think she's not been able to join us and i'll hand over now to kiran for a formal uh, introduction uh, so that he can introduce the speaker and we can get going uh, we'll have geeta speak for about 35 to 40 minutes and then we have a chance of uh, a question answer with her so thank you again geeta and uh, welcome to our seminar series kiran over to you thank you sir so uh, a very good evening to one and all uh, welcome to the sitara seminar series today with us we have geeta ramaswamy who is based at the nature conservation foundation she is a program manager at a country wide citizen science project called seasons watch where several people especially school students watch trees in their neighborhoods and collect information about their seasonality her phd degree was on an invasive plant lantana camera where she tried to understand how the environment affects where and how the species spreads and also how indigenous species respond to the presence of this invasive plant on behalf of the sitara family i welcome you ma'am uh, i hand over to you you can start sharing the screen and present thank you thank you so much pankaj and kiran for your kind words and i'm very glad to be here thank you for the opportunity uh, for giving me the opportunity to come here and speak to this community and i'm very excited to present our project and some of the findings that we've had over the past few years and how we might be using this to understand the climate better so i'll just quickly share my screen um i hope my screen is visible it is geeta yes go ahead please all right thanks so today um thank you all for joining and today i'm going to be talking about how one can track climate change through trees uh but before we begin let's look at uh, the idea of looking at seasonal change and why that's important in biological systems on this slide over here you see three very different types of organisms the first one is an invertebrate it's a common crow butterfly uh it starts its uh, life as an egg it hatches out into a caterpillar goes through several molts then it becomes a pupa then it emerges as this adult butterfly that would make maybe uh, local migrations in a particular season the second organism on this slide is a pied cuckoo or a jacobin cuckoo uh, if you uh, live in peninsular india you might have heard of folklore describing how the monsoon is heralded by the calls of this uh, pied cuckoo and uh, there is evidence that uh, this animal moves locally migrates up and down the latitudes 
uh, just before the monsoon sets in. Uh, so its movement is linked to the monsoon season. The third organism here is a large woody tree. In this photograph, it is completely leafless. It's a ghost tree or uh, Sterculia uens. And uh, this tree began its life as a seed. And it spent several years going through phases like seedling, then it became a sapling, then it became a girthy sapling, then it put on height, and then it became an adult, after which it started producing flowers, which became fruits. Now, the study of this cyclic seasonal change is something that's common to all these uh, organisms. And uh, this is known as phenology. Phenology is an amazing thing to look at in nature because it is tightly linked to the environment as a whole, and it is very sensitive to even slight changes in what is happening in the larger environment. Now to uh, explain this uh, idea a little bit more, we'll go to the temperate latitudes where uh, plants behave a certain way. This is because there is a growing season for plants when it is warm enough uh, for metabolism to occur in plants. And uh, this season is when plants would put out new leaves, grow, uh, put out flowers, fruits, reproduce for that uh, year. And then during the fall season, which is when the temperature starts dropping and it uh, becomes less and less conducive for metabolism, the trees also drop their leaves. Uh, they shed all their leaves and remain leafless throughout the uh, winter season, which is metabolically non-conducive. In temperate regions, uh, even slight changes in um, temperatures, uh, annual temperatures in the onset of a season can trigger these events very dramatically. Um, over the past uh, two decades or so, there is more and more evidence that temperate trees are changing their phenology, changing their uh, behavior according to how temperature is changing. And, and that in turn is affected by uh, uh, global warming uh, and climate change. So uh, why should one really care about this? Okay, so trees are doing something uh, strange. They are not behaving the way they're expected to behave. Uh, but how trees behave is again linked intimately with the phenology of other organisms. Um, after all, trees are primary producers. There are secondary, um, uh, in the trophic level, there are uh, partners now that feed on the matter produced by this tree. Those animals in turn are eaten by other animals that uh, depend on them for their survival and growth and reproduction. So just to give you a quick example, um, this is one of the most well-studied, nice linear uh, ways in which uh, climate change has known to affect tree phenology and the phenology of everything else that is downstream in this trophic change, uh, trophic chain. So this is a pedunculate oak. It's a temperate tree, like other temperate trees. It puts out leaves only when the season is conducive, only when the spring season sets in. And this is marked by a series of consecutive days which are warm enough for the tree to metabolize in certain way. Now, over the past uh, few years, what has happened is that this season, the growing season is now setting in earlier, 10 to 15 days earlier than usual. So the uh, gregarious putting out of leaves uh, is happening earlier than what is historically known. This affects this winter moth, which uh, puts its egg around the same time, uh, around the time such that the larvae hatch out when the uh, you know, tender budding leaves of pedunculate oak are available for eating. Uh, for the winter moth larva. Now, this in turn is food for these passerine birds, like uh, such as this cinereus uh, uh, stick, which eats feeds the on this uh, larvae of these caterpillars, uh, or sorry, larvae of these moth, um, and also this coincides with the nesting season of these uh, passerine birds. So, not just they, but also their chicks are being fed on the winter moth larvae. Now, because the pedunculate oak has shifted its uh, you know, bud burst season, the season in which new leaves emerge, uh, winter moth larvae, which are invertebrates, can evolve much more fast, have also now adapted to hatching out earlier. Uh, the paris, the passerine birds, on the other hand, are vertebrates, and their habits and uh, adaptations are not so, uh, quite so rapid, and they take a much longer time to adjust to these changes. Uh, so they continue to nest at a time uh, which is more similar to their historic nesting patterns. So what is now happening is that the winter moth larvae are all, already not larvae by the time that the passerine birds are nesting. So perhaps it is resulting in some of those nestlings 
uh, not getting enough food because the prey uh, animal is not available. So this is a nice example of how the change in phenology of a tree has affected the change in phenology of an invertebrate species. And then that in turn is affecting the life cycle of a vertebrate species. Um, but this is temperate regions where the seasonality is governed largely by temperature of um, uh, warm temperature and cold temperature. If we hop down into the tropics, it's not quite the same because seasonality here is not really about temperature change. Uh, it's not the difference in temperature between winter and summer, but it is all kinds of other things like precipitation. So here, over uh, historical time, trees have adapted um, uh, and they have a, a diversity of phenology strategies. So unlike the temperate uh, regions in the tropics, in the same region, you might find trees that are deciduous, which shed their leaves during a particular season. And at the same latitude at some other place, you might find a tree which is evergreen, which does not shed its leaves at all. Leaves at all. Uh, there could be leaf exchanging species. They could be semi-evergreen species. Their reproductive phenologies are also varied. Uh, species may choose to have multiple flowering cycles in a year or have one flowering cycle in two years or flower all the time, flower and root all the time. So these are all phenological strategies that you find in the tropics. And not only that, the different populations of the same species might adopt different types of phenological strategies. Different species on the same latitude could adopt different types of uh, phenological strategies. And then this is again complicated by the community of uh, plants that you find in a particular region. So it is really very difficult to pinpoint how changes in the climate are affecting the phenology of tropical tree species because there is so much diversity of uh, strategies. <clears throat> Some um, studies that have been done in other parts of the world have um, identified temperature, precipitation, and day length as potential triggers for various phenological responses of tropical trees, like putting out of flowers, putting out of fruits, uh, etc. Um, day length here, by the way, is the only factor that does not get affected by climate change. Temperature and precipitation, of course, are highly affected by climate change. Let's come to India. Now, to really understand uh, how like an external factor like changing temperatures is affecting tree phenology, one needs to have a good idea about inherent variability, inherent diversity of phenological strategies of plant communities. This um, requires long-term data. It requires that we observe uh, tree species and communities of trees for very, very long periods of time. Uh, there is really no maximum number of years that one can observe really. Uh, one just needs to observe them all the time. And these type of studies, long-term studies, and by long-term, I mean 10 years or more of observation are very rare in India. So uh, if you see these dots, they represent the length of a study in which the phenology of species was observed. And barring, uh, except for this particular um, plot here, which is a long-term monitoring plot in Mughalai, which has been around for 25 years, um, all the other studies across India are, um, uh, vary between two and five years. Now, two and five years is really not enough uh, time to understand how the phenology of uh, different of a single species is changing, let alone large communities of uh, plants that share the same uh, environment. So how does one go about um, understanding uh, phenology then? Um, one could uh, you know, really scale up the level at which information is gathered over space and over time and do it for a long time. And only then be, one can really um, make conclusive statements about how phenology is changing in the tropical uh, parts of um, uh, the world and especially in India. Now, here is where citizen science comes. Why are phenology studies only two to five years? Because scientists are limited by how much logistical support they have, how much funding they have, how much manpower they have. Uh, permission to view these trees and for how long those permissions are there. So uh, all of these things actually restrict the number of species and the duration of which regular scientists can study uh, phenology. But trees are everywhere. Common um, uh, tropical trees are also widespread. Uh, people are very likely to also know them because they might be there in the neighborhood. They might be utilizing parts of that plant 
and may have cultural importance uh, for people. So why not engage uh, non-professional scientists, uh, people who are not trained in botany or in data science or in statistics? Why, why not engage uh, people like that in collecting information? And uh, this is basically known as citizen science where the community produces uh, scientific knowledge. Uh, it's a sort of, um, in the most idealistic form, a way of democratizing science where uh, it is by the people and for the people, the information and knowledge that is created. Now, this not only um, makes the community involved in the process of uh, generation scientific knowledge, it also makes the information accessible to them. Um, usually science, we, we produce information that is locked away uh, behind paywall journals in jargon that people cannot really understand outside of your super specialized field. So here is an opportunity where scientific knowledge can be created, which is directly accessible to the community of people. For biodiversity science especially, citizen science is really great because it helps um, inventorying biodiversity and studying seasonality over long, uh, large space and over long periods of time. It's exactly the kind of information we need to understand uh, long-term changes due to things like climate change. So just to uh, give you a quick example, uh, there are, uh, these two are uh, citizen science portals. The one above is called iNaturalist and the one below is eBird. These are the websites for these um, uh, projects. Uh, please go visit them. Um, and here is a species that is recorded on the iNaturalist uh, website, which is the Bengal Monitor Lizard. Uh, if uh, you know, an ecologist or a um, person with interest in Bengal Monitor, needed to find out the range of the species. Imagine the logistical constraint in going up and down all across India to find the range of the species. However, uh, based on the information contributed uh, by 667 observers, one can actually make a range map of the species all across India. So the, the scale at which uh, data is coming in to a citizen science project is immense. The second um, example here is that of the seasonality of um, appearance of certain species in a particular locality. So here are uh, species of uh, birds over here. And this is basically the month in which you're likely to find them. And you can see that while some species are persistent throughout the year, some others are rare visitors and they are oh, present God. only in some other uh, parts of the year. So even over long periods of time, one um, can get in, uh, a valuable information through citizen science uh, that helps us understand seasonality better. Um, the added, uh, uh, added opportunity of citizen science is that it helps create awareness and a connection with the environment. Now, uh, one can bombard people with facts about, citizen, uh, about uh, climate change, but uh, everyone really knows how much hesitance uh, there is in accepting um, that there is such a thing happening you know, at the world scale. So why not actually participate in an activity that demonstrates it directly, right? You can see change happening over real time uh, in front of your own eyes. And that might create a much deeper connection with the environment, uh, might promote a sense of uh, um, um, uh, you know, a love and a nurturing for the environment and may inspire people to protect it better uh, under conditions like climate change. So are there uh, citizen science projects monitoring phenology over long scales, uh, large scales and long term? Yes, uh, I'll talk about two projects here. Uh, the first one here is the USA National Phenology Network, which is based in the US. And uh, here, uh, there they uh, again look at how um, the spring response of plants, which is putting out new leaves, has changed over time and how it is dis different from what is historically known. So if you look at this uh, map over here, uh, this is updated till May 23rd, 2021. And all the red regions over here represent those plants or uh, those regions where plants uh, put out leaves 20 days earlier than expected. And the dark blue ones are 20 days later than expected. So across the US, you can see that citizen contributed data has led to an understanding that uh, several parts of the country are experiencing temperature change 
in uh, in the spring and this is in in turn detectable in the form of uh, plants putting out leaves earlier than usual so this is uh, this uh, type of information of course immediately provides us uh, opportunities to investigate the environmental factors that are then affecting uh, these changes in india with a similar um, aim in mind there is season watch which is a citizen science project and adults and children are equally welcome to participate in this project uh, it's a 10 year old project it started in 2011 and since then uh, the project has garnered nearly 5 lakh observations and uh, over 90000 trees have been monitored um, and a, a interested individuals um, more than 1200 interested individuals and more than 1400 schools are part of this project uh, if you go to our website which is this www.seasonwatch.in and go to the explore page over there you can quickly get a summary of the kind of uh, data that we have for different species that are being observed across india and uh, i want you to also note that um, you know lots of these dots are concentrated over here in the state of kerala and i'll come back to this particular detail later um citizen scientists contribute information either directly on the season watch website or they use an android phone app um to upload uh, information um in places where there is no access to technology there's also paper um, paper and pen approach where uh, there are these observation sheets that uh, children or adults can fill in and then later whenever they have access to the internet or um you know a computer or a phone they can quickly upload these uh, observations that they have made so what is it that people contributing to season watch what do they actually do uh they first locate a tree of interest like this beautiful tree this is the flame of the forest tree or butea monosperma and uh, this uh, beautiful tree um, does this what you see in this picture it has seasonal flowering uh, where it loses all its leaves and then it's just covered in scarlet blooms and that's where it gets its name uh, flame of the forest from uh, if you go to central india or peninsular india where there are lots of these trees Uh, scattered across the landscape they'll all be synchronously flowering and it's just spectacular to see so like this uh, flame of the forest tree there are 138 other species that one can find one usually finds commonly uh, in rural and urban areas across india or uh, species that are locally abundant and important for people there culturally uh, that are there on our list uh, so a contributor would first select a species that is there in the neighborhood then they will select a tree uh, whose canopy is vis visible this is a great example of a tree to uh, monitor and then they would upload uh, information on leaves flowers and fruits onto the uh, website or the um, app um, using a very simple uh, thumb rule which is the rule of the thirds here you just divide the canopy into thirds and then um, see whether leaves flowers and fruits and the different stages of leaves flowers and fruits which is young leaf mature leaf dying leaf a flower bud and an open flower ripe and unripe fruits if they are present in these thirds or not if they are not there then you mark it as none if they are present in only one third of the uh, tree then you mark it as few if it's uh, present in more than one third you mark it as many now this is a very simple protocol which is designed for people to quickly go assess make an as um, more or less objective assessment of the canopy of a tree and now imagine like thousands of people across india are doing this how do we ensure consistency in observation right so this is a protocol that allows for that it's simple enough easy enough to learn and quick enough to do that people um, pick it up quite fast uh, once they are trained um and uh, people are also expected to upload information on the same tree every week so there's weekly phenology of a registered tree uh, which is in which apart from weekly observations there is also the option of making observations once once in a while so supposing you are traveling somewhere and you see an interesting tree and you quickly want to make a note of the flowers fruits and leaves of that tree you can do that as well now once all of this information comes in 
uh, what does a project like season watch do? How do we make the connection between somebody observing a tree in some part of India to the environment? Now, this is a work in progress. We are still working our way through the different steps of this process. And um, at any point of time, if you have any suggestions to give us, uh, we really welcome uh, these suggestions um, and uh, look forward to these uh, suggestions. So just to start, I'll summarize, uh, I'll start summarizing the kind of data that, that comes into season watch now. So um, these are the top four species that are observed in season watch, mango, jackfruit, teak, and coconut. Now one can understand why these are uh, very high, highly observed, right? Because the uh, top two species are fruiting trees that are beloved fruiting trees wherever they grow. Everyone can identify a mango and a jackfruit tree. Uh, the other two species are also fairly common and easy to recognize. And um, well, I, I think nobody can mistake a coconut tree ever. Uh, so these are easy to recognize species that one find uh, one could find uh, find in the neighborhood easily. And uh, these are the ones that are being observed the most. Uh, these numbers that you see here are the total number of trees that are being observed in the season watch at present. Once all this data comes in, uh, the most basic thing we have been able to do till now is that we have uh, tried to, um, you know, sort of describe the seasonality of uh, different species, uh, tree species that we have on the list. So one would think that you know the seasonality of mango should be known. Uh, mango is a, it's it's a summer fruit after all. Everyone knows mango. Uh, for sure, there is enough information on mango. Uh, why do we even need to do this? Uh, however, how mango behaves in a particular region is um, it's it's very typical to that particular region. Mango is very widespread species. It's find, found across India, but it behaves in a certain way in southern India whereas it behaves a uh, different way in Northern India. So those uh, generalizations are still pretty uh, interesting to me. Uh, those are still pretty uh, novel in a sense um, uh, of description of this uh, particular species. So in this graph, um, you can see that there's a peak in flowering in March and a peak in fruiting in April. That you might find that strange. Um, people from peninsular India might, find, might think it's okay, but others from Northern India would uh, vehemently disagree and say that actually mango peak should be in June. And we'll come to that in a bit. Now, um, this uh, information is based on repeated observations of uh, mango trees. But uh, like I said, we also have the option of observing trees once in a while and uploading information. So we use this particular method of observation and conducted four bio blitz events where people were encouraged to just go out and measure all the trees in the neighborhood and just uh, upload a one-time information. And this was done in December, March, June, and September, uh, December 2018 to September 2019. And uh, the bio blitz varied between uh, two and four days. <clears throat> and what you can see here is the percent trees with fruits across different latitudes was different uh, and the, the peak in the person trees with fruits was different across different latitudes. So all the southern latitudes showed more or less peak fruiting by March. And uh, when I say peak fruiting, this means it includes uh, ripe and unripe fruits. Whereas the more northern uh, latitude, which is more than 15 degrees, uh, showed a peak much later in June. So here we were able to very neatly detect in one shot the behavior of a very common widespread species across different latitudes. So here's something that we now have to control for when we think of how mango is changing with climate change. It's a response, the baseline response itself is different across uh, different latitudes. Um, coming back to why uh, why is this strange, uh, you know, binning of latitudes over here, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, and uh, 12 to 15, and then greater than 15? Um, this is because, uh, remember that graph where I showed that most points are, uh, are concentrated in Kerala? So these, all these three bins of latitudes um, are represented in peninsular India, and that's where we get most of our observations from. And Kerala contributes the most number of observations 
on average a single person from kerala contributes 316 observations per year um followed by andhra pradesh and then by uttarakhand and meghalaya so um on average the number of contributions per person in uh, southern india is much larger than that of northern india and we sometimes don't have enough information to actually generalize uh, in northern india <clears throat> right so this brings us to the, the the question that you know is climate can we really detect um, you know things like climate change affecting mango so since we have a lot of information from kerala we decided to focus our attention in kerala and uh, try to describe how mango is behaving since the beginning of the project there um, and whether it has shown any changes or not so if you look at uh, this description here it goes from 2014 to 2021 and uh, it was it's uh, it's showing um slight increase in the proportion of trees with flowers during the peak flowering season and in 2020 and 21 there is a sudden dip in the proportion of flowering the month in which this peak flowering is observed in mango in um, kerala is also highly variable uh, going from january to um a, um april uh, in uh, some cases so um this extremely wide window of peak phenology that is peak flowering in a particular species again sort of uh, restricts us from making uh, exact inferences about how the climate is um, changing the phenology of species now the inherent variability itself is two months how do we detect uh, changes that could be uh, really minute um uh, that are being affected by the larger climate so um my colleague krishna did this um basic correlation analysis and try to figure out whether there was actually a connection between um this pattern of sudden uh, drop in the proportion trees flowering and uh, environmental factors and the factor that she chose to explore was precipitation now this is based on anecdotal reports from citizen scientists uh whenever citizen scientists said that um it was raining before time uh this was, there was a summer season and then it suddenly rained and all the flowers fell and therefore uh, the fruit crop that followed uh, this rainfall also reduced so this was an intuition that was uh, derived from the citizen scientists and krishna decided to explore this uh, further and what she did was she um Uh, try to find whether the uh, peak flowering the proportion of uh, tree showing peak flowering uh, could be correlated with the total rainfall that the tree experienced in the previous year or the total rainfall experienced in just during the winter uh, just during the winter season in the previous year or just during the northeast monsoon um, in the previous year and uh, the answer is not clear um so if you look at uh, total rainfall uh, over the past 7 uh, um, years uh, over which the data has been collected in the state of kerala there has been a lot of variation in the total rainfall uh, that has been observed if you look at the winter rain uh, again that is more or less uh, consistent except in 2021 where the rain, winter rain was much higher than usual and the northeast monsoon again was highly variable throughout the year so there is actually no uh, uh, evidence of uh, precipitation affecting the proportion flowering um, in mango in the state of kerala we are yet to look at some other types of uh, some other uh, environmental factors that are affected by climate change temperature for one um, mango physiology is known to be affected by temperature um uh, even really local differences in temperature might be affecting things like flowering and uh, in uh, mango uh, for example people have reported that trees that are closer to roads uh, tend to flower uh, earlier than the trees that are away from the roads uh, even uh, the same tree that is uh, by the road side the branches that are closer to the road might be flowering much before the branches that are away from the road so that's another um, climatic parameter we are yet to look at and if anyone here has any ideas of how we can look at these correlations in a more meaningful way i really welcome your suggestions and look forward to those suggestions now <clears throat> how does one 
um, so supposing there was this ideal situation where we had perfect information on a particular species for hundreds of years, um, then one can really look at the trend across those uh, 100 years and uh, see how the climate, uh, which has changed over the past 50 or so years, how that is affecting the phenology of uh, trees. Uh, in a country like India, such type of information is not available. On the other hand, in temperate regions, there has been meticulous documentation of the phenology of uh, various species uh, for many hundreds of years. Um, uh, it, it's also uh, slightly commonsensical to know the phenology of plants because, well, our, all of our uh, you know, agriculture is based on the knowledge of phenology of plants. Our food comes from the knowledge of phenology of plants. So uh, these things are um, documented in written there are long-term records of these things in the temperate regions, but the knowledge that is there in uh, places like India, where um, it's not documented systematically, but there in cultural knowledge is something that we need to tap into. So here's a wacky idea where, uh, because we don't have systematic documentation of uh, phenology over the long term uh, for different species, um, can we use cultural uh, references as baseline or historic phenology to compare uh, recent changes in phenology at least? So yeah. just to give you an example, sorry. Yeah, Pankaj, you've hit the 30 minute mark. Okay. You can take your time. There's no hurry, but just to inform you, yes. I'll be done in two minutes, uh, four minutes. You can take more than that also, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so just to give you an example, this is uh, phenology of the Japanese cherry blossom, uh, which has been observed in the city of Kyoto in Japan for more than 1200 years. Uh, this is such a culturally important plant that people have celebrated spring along with the blooms of the cherry blossom for 1200 odd years. And uh, various, across various generations, this has been documented in different ways. The most recent way of documenting this is scientific um, um, intents and uh, written down and all that. Uh, but uh, historically, it's been noted by, let's say, scribes of the court of the royal palace and uh, people like that. So um, uh, Eono and Kazui, uh, they were able to reconstruct the phenology of the species and found that the peak flowering, sorry, peak flowering in cherry blossom in Kyoto, uh, which used to occur between the 10th and 20th of April um, for nearly, um, 1000 years, changed suddenly after the industrial revolution, where the onset of the peak bloom in the species was, was much earlier. So can we, so this cultural uh, attachment to a particular species, this cultural documentation of the species was allowed scientists to infer that a particular change in the climate um, is what is affecting the phenology. Uh, the phenology is an indicator of now, can we do something similar for India? It is really difficult, but there are some species that are historically known to follow a certain pattern of uh, flowering and fruiting. And uh, there are more and more anecdotal evidence uh, saying that these flowering and fruiting patterns might be changing in contemporary times. So I'll give you a quick example of the Indian laburnum or Cassia fistula, which is associated with the festival of Vishu in Kerala. Vishu typically comes in the second week of April on the 14th or the 15th of April. Every year, it's usually these two dates which are Vishu. And people use the blossoms of Cassia Fistula for celebration, uh, celebrating uh, this particular festival. Now, uh, people are now claiming that this flower is not available during Vishu. And people now have to resort to other substitutes, other yellow flowers or plastic flowers, uh, to celebrate Vishu. So here was an opportunity to actually see that the data that we have got over the past six, seven, eight years, whether that corroborated this um, anecdotal thing that people were um, seeing in their own neighborhoods. So we looked at the flowering phenology of uh, cassia trees in uh, Kerala and plotted it against um, the expected date of flowering peak, which is during Vishu over here. And we found that indeed, uh, most, most trees were flowering. The, I mean, even though the peak was pretty high, even though more than uh, 
about 90% of trees had some kinds of flowers on them. Uh, trees which had many flowers, remember the thirds rule. So the trees that had many flowers were um, much fewer and they were much before the uh, Vishu uh, festival. Uh, the other uh, funky thing that was happening was that uh, cassia trees had nearly 40, uh, between 20 and uh, for, uh, sorry, 20 and 50% uh, trees flowering at all times of the year. Now, which is very strange because cassia is known to be highly seasonal in its flowering. It's not expected to be flowering throughout the year. And this is again something that uh, people noticed and pointed out. One uh, reason for this could be that Kerala is drying up. If you look at the rainfall anomaly over the for past 100 years or so, Kerala seems to be, um, in the uh, since uh, 1960s, uh, seems to be getting drier and drier and drier. So this is uh, rainfall data. There's also evidence from other kinds of um, uh, things like the appearance of uh, dry region species in Kerala, um, you know, uh, uh, for example, the peacock, which is uh, not supposed to be found in most parts of Kerala, is now found uh, in many parts of Kerala, indicating a drying up of the larger um, ecosystem. And uh, the other um, link between this and the Cassia vistula species is that uh, people have noticed that the Cassia's which receive a lot of water, tend to flower only in the season that they're expected to flower in. But those that are drier, in drier parts of the city, or they don't receive extra water from outside, tend to flower throughout the year. So there seems to be an inkling of a correlation between the increasing dryness or the increasing uh, uh, reduction in and total annual rainfall in the state and the way that trees are behaving. Then again, this is a uh, very um, preliminary sort of correlation and we would really appreciate if people can suggest some better ways of looking at this correlation uh, at coming uh, up with better ways of associating these two patterns together. So is Cassia the only species that we can look at using cultural references? Um, actually, no, India has a wealth of uh, cultural knowledge on all kinds of uh, wonderful, uh, uh, important trees. Um, so for example, the flame of the forest a tree that I spoke about earlier is associated with the festival of Holi in North India. And there too people, um, and this is because the flowers are used to make dyes, uh, you know, for the festival of Holi. And people are noticing that the flower is not available during the festival to make the dye. Um, Neem, which is uh, an important part of uh, Pongal and Ugadi festivals in southern India, um, that is expected to flower during uh, Pongal and Ugadi, which is typically in March, April. Uh, again, people are noticing the quantum of flowering, the timing of flowering seems to be off. Um, the other species that you uh, see here is Maduka longifolia or the Mahua tree. It is a very important non-timber forest product. Uh, for people, um, uh, for communities living inside uh, forest areas, culturally extremely important. Uh, it's an extremely seasonal tree as well. And uh, people are now noticing uh, that the, again, the quantum of flowering and the uh, season of flowering is a little bit off uh, in this particular species as well. So here is a case for using uh, cultural references um, as baselines for understanding the uh, change in the phenology of uh, species in India. So I would like to end here and take questions, uh, but quickly before that, to thank all of our partners, NCBS and Wipro, as well as our partner organizations, Matrabhumi Seed, SCST Meghalaya, FES and Keystone Foundations, um, uh, who work with people who do the hard work of reaching out to people and training them in collecting information and to all of our wonderful citizen scientists who you can see in this uh, photograph for, for tirelessly contributing nearly five lakh data points over the past many years. Thank you so much. And here are some details about season watch. I, I can take questions. Thank you, Geeta. Uh, that was uh, absolutely uh, fascinating and we can actually have you go on for much longer. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, very insightful, very intriguing, very challenging. Thank you so much. So we can open up the panel, the, the session for this, uh, for questions. 
and maybe i'd request uh, if the students can go first and then uh, uh, then faculty of course and we'll see if there are no responses there are some questions on the youtube channel which we'll pick up once we've done with the questions here i think i can see a hand up chandan uh, if you can briefly introduce yourself and then ask your question please hi chandan hello hi yeah yeah i yeah. am uh, sir sir i am bj bal yes chandan we can hear you we can see you go ahead please yeah 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 so so ma'am i am a first year student uh, phd at sitara and my basic background is food, food process engineering so whatever just lecture i have heard here so i have some like uh, basic uh, like uh, in my dist i i am belongs to madhubani bihar and ma'am we have some mango plantation so what is happening now after the 1995 we are getting the fruits in the mango at the interval of one year and before 1995 we used to get the each year and uh, uh, after that we are getting the interval of one year uh, but, and we are also maintaining the nutrition level and everything to the plant but uh, still we are not able to get the each year so how to do with the approval region madam and how we can just solve the problem um i am actually not the correct person to answer this perhaps a person with an experience in horticulture might be better able to advise you but uh, what i can say is that the interannual gap between flowering and fruiting in mango is something that you see in the wild type of mango so the non cultivated varieties do this they uh, sometimes skip a year um i'm not sure but it could be maybe because of the age of the plants or maybe because of um maybe some uh, parasites or infections uh, that are attacking the plants maybe these things are causing that gap in flowering and fruiting but um to infer that larger climate might be affecting this is again uh maybe you can explore that actually since 1995 if you can sort of find evidence for change in uh, precipitation or temperature in that region maybe that's one uh, explanation for the fact that mangoes are behaving really does that answer your question yeah ma'am thank you there is one question in the chat geeta which i think is a standard question that comes uh, this is from nirmal thank you for the interesting presentation how do you ascertain the validity accuracy of the data in a citizen science project format i think right. a evergreen question for citizen science promoters absolutely uh, it's a very valid question and i think i should speak about it in the presentation from next time on um uh, so to um, make sure that one is making correct inferences of course one needs to have accurate data and uh, most citizen science projects have multiple ways of assessing accuracy firstly they might invest in training their citizen scientists very well they might uh, choose species that are easy to identify people are unlikely to make mistakes in identifying the species and the phases of that that species goes through and this is the approach that season watch also takes uh other uh, uh, other uh, citizen science projects also have uh, quality assessments once the information is uploaded so they could uh, ask for a photograph uh, to verify the observation that they have made so whether the photograph corroborates with the observation they could have automated ways in which you know an algorithm simply scans through the observations and uh, it compares it against some standards and the a reasonable variation around that standard and quickly flags Uh, observations that might fall outside of that standard there are uh, citizen science projects that use reviewers uh, these are people who um, are expert understand the data and the species and everything very well and they scan the data and uh, flag potential erroneous um, observations all of these things require infrastructure and manpower and technology and money to do and uh, some citizen science projects are just not able to do all of this so at season watch we focus on the training and uh, training bit where we ascertain that people know their species they know their observation protocol and um, um, we trust uh, the citizen scientists a lot in um, what they contribute uh, trust in um, you know the contributors is a huge factor as well in citizen science Uh, if i might just step in here and ask have there been instances when uh, you know after having done all this in season watch or have had a case of 
having to retract a data point or some information that was included but then found to be completely incorrect or inappropriate? Sure, we do some sorts of uh, filtering. So, for example, um, during our BioBlitz events, there were uh, reports of pear trees from Kerala. So, which is very unlikely. You know, a pear tree does not naturally grow in Kerala. It's a high altitude species. It's more likely to be found in Himalaya. So, we like quickly know that, you know, that there is most likely a mistake over there. So, we uh, confirm with the uh, citizen scientists. If they're adamant that, you know, it is a pear tree, then of course we uh, remove it from the data. We, we uh, ended up removing all these uh, unusual species from the data. Okay. There is a question on uh, chat from Paresh, who's also a PhD candidate in Sitara. He says, very interesting ideas and fascinating presentation. A uh, curious if there have been efforts to involve universities in institutional capacities in such a long-term research. We have been, um, we have had this idea in our mind for a very long time, uh, which is having a campus phenology network. And uh, in recently over the past six months or so, we've had a lot of interest from universities from across India. And uh, we really wanted to take off uh, at some point of time, once people are allowed back onto campuses, um, maybe uh, we will surely uh, begin a campus phenology network. I guess right now, because of the pandemic, most campuses are not functional fully. And there are two more technical kinds of questions, uh, Geeta. And maybe we can take one more after that. So there's Tanvi on YouTube who asks, uh, what are leaf exchanging species? Or maybe that was misunderstood, I don't know. And Paresh also was asking, how are indicator species, uh, if any in brackets, identified regionally? Uh, so, okay, leaf exchange, so uh, deciduous is very apparent, right? They drop all their leaves, they're leafless for some time, and then they get all the leaves. Right? Evergreen are also apparent because they, their leaves are coming and they're growing and they're dying quickly. And this, uh, I mean, this is happening all the time. Leaf exchanging species are species which have put out new leaves, uh, sorry, uh, which have leaves and uh, which also get rid of the leaves around the same time, but also at the same time, lots of new leaves also come. So it's very rapid and happens synchronous, like together. So, what would be an example of a prominent example of that? Oh, common okay. example. Do we have Sorry, any? These, these are forest species, and I'm forgetting now. Okay. Sorry, I'll I'll get back to you on this. And Parish's question was, uh, how are indicator species identified regionally? If if that is done at all. Indicator species. Uh, you mean um, things that are uh, res. I guess maybe he means that it's a quick response to the change in climate. Uh, maybe. I don't know, maybe you can just go ahead sure. and assumption and answer that. I, I'm not sure if we, if we can get a clarification from him because he's on YouTube. Right. Okay. So actually, um, we don't have indicator species yet. We don't know what species are good indicators of the climate yet because we are still trying to understand all the kinds of variation that exist in phenology because of, you know, uh, the uh, where they're found in space and in time. So once that bit is sorted, maybe we can identify indicator species, which are responding only to climate, which are, you know, the signal is only climate and not anything else. Well, that would be difficult to do because how do you exclude those it other will, factors? It will be really difficult. Yeah. And because we are also looking at very common and widespread species, we are unlikely to find indicator species because they're found everywhere. They're general species found everywhere. Right. There are two more questions in the chat, uh, Gita. Mm -hmm. Both are students at Chitara. Shreyas is asking, it would be interesting to understand spatial variation of precipitation and phenology data in Kerala's case. Absolutely, yes. So if uh, Shrey knows of uh, data sets that we can use on climate, uh, which are at different scales, uh, we would really appreciate that. So right now, Krishna, who did the analysis, found some data sets at the scale of uh, Kerala state and at the scale of some districts, but not anything finer than that. So if you have, um, absolutely, the spatial variation precipitation and the phenology would be like amazing to um, get at. Um, if you have access or suggestions for data sets like this, please let me know. And one question by Kiran, what factors, attributes you look into while deciding the variations in flowering over time? So right now we are only, um, okay, so uh, the information that is coming in 
is whether a, um, the flowering is present uh, and if it is present, if it's less or lots, right? So the parameter we look at is proportion of trees showing that particular uh, phenobase. We tried looking at, uh, you know, uh, how individual species, individual trees uh, might be responding to the environment, but it's just the nature of the data that there are lots of gaps in the data that comes in. So we sort of average it uh, over a fortnightly period, a two weekly period, and just look at the proportion of trees that, are, that show a particular uh, phenophase. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, we'll take one last question. Uh, this is from Shashank. He's saying, how does uh, information gathered on a digital medium, how is it used by local communities? More like a, you know, like a people's biodiversity register. So does that happen? How does that happen? What is your experience? Right. So right now we work with two organizations, uh, Foundation for Ecological Security and Keystone Foundation, who work with uh, communities that typically don't have access to technology, but they have immense ecological knowledge and very, uh, uh, like, uh, not just ecological contemporary knowledge, but also historical knowledge of the phenology. So what happens there is that the organization acts as a go-between uh, between uh, this project season watch and uh, the people on the ground. Uh, so once enough information uh, comes in uh, the hands of uh, those people, um, it'll be interesting to know how they use it. Uh, so uh, typically uh, what these communities want to use this information for is, um, let's say, uh, knowing the flowering season so that they can track um, beehives um, um, because they use the honey uh, that is available from these beehives. So the link between flowering phenology and the uh, uh, beehives, which gives them a product that they use in their own livelihood. So, but these are only two communities. Otherwise, there are uh, are uh, eighty, nearly ninety percent of our communities actually school students. So they um, uh, the, their teachers firmly believe that. You, uh, you know, participating in a project like a citizen science project is um, great for the overall, uh, you know, growth of children. Uh, firstly, that their observation skills are improving. Secondly, they're learning how to be meticulous and organized. Thirdly, they are uh, going and meeting a tree every week and forming a bond with that tree. And maybe someday would advocate against bad things happening to the tree. So this is how the project affects people who are actually contributing information. And all of this is anecdotal. We have not made any quantitative assessment of these things. Right. So on that note, uh, I don't, we don't have any more questions. Uh, we can wait for a if minute. I, if I may, I, can yes, I Yes, yes, please. Yes, yeah. of course. So I was just curious in terms of any kind of uh, anthropal, uh, I mean, uh, human interference in the tree cycle, like flowering stage or early fruiting stage or whatever so uh, or not only human but sometimes it may be other uh, animal species also or some insects or some attack or some uh, whatever diseases etc so does that also, i mean that will also lead to some kind of uh, anomalies in terms of the uh, whatever observations are recorded for leaves and flowers existence or not existence etc so how does it I mean, how is it accounted for? You're absolutely because, right. I mean, it should not misrepresent like a climatic change because it may be very different factors which are playing some role in this. So, Absolutely, yes, certainly. So uh, one way of keeping track of um, the natural herbivores that uh, occur on a tree, there's an option on the app and on the website to make a note of uh, whether a herbivore was present there or not. Um, other factors like humans lopping a branch or you know, spraying, like cutting off the tree, uh, other kinds of nailing tree, uh, people can make notes uh, on the uh, website and the app that these other changes are also happening. Um, additionally, when a tree is added to the database, there are a number of factors uh, that uh, people can optionally upload. Uh, including indication of the age of the tree, proximity to a water source, um, um, girth of a tree, or height of a tree, all these things they can also upload. So uh, at present, because the information is optional, 
uh, most people choose not to upload that information uh, but wherever it is uh, available we are trying to account for those things but yeah you are absolutely right i mean it's um, it's something that's difficult to keep track of and uh, could be affecting phenology other than climate thank you okay great do you uh, would you like to last couple of minutes uh, geeta would you like to say anything else that you might have missed out or you want to say before we can wrap up um just that uh, i mean uh, i would encourage everyone here to you know contribute to citizen science projects that are there uh, in india because it gives us an opportunity uh, biodiversity citizen science uh, also there are other types of citizen science projects uh, related to other kinds of things like astronomy or water quality soil quality you can please look them up and uh, contribute uh, information to these portals um it's because i mean it's it's sort of a huge community that is uh, you know working together to understand our environment better so what better way uh, you know than to participate in an uh, effort like this along with so many other thousands of uh, people from the country so i would really uh, encourage everyone here to be, become part of some of the other citizen science project it's a great uh, opportunity to also go out there was and hang around with trees and birds and insects if you want if you like those things thanks thanks a lot geeta so i'm just, just wondering uh, just wondering whether you have tried uh, approaching nss or any such uh, student activity formally or informally uh, to get associated with this effort so that it can be multiplied and uh not with any uh, government or student uh forums no but um, so we partner with uh, this uh, group called matabhumi in kerala and they have this seed program uh, which is targeted at uh, school students so it's a huge network of schools that fall under that uh, matabhumi seed program and uh, they reach out to hundreds of schools every year so that is the only um, large uh, school network that we associate with um the other school network we are associated with is the state council for science technology and environment in meghalaya there again uh, they have these uh, eco clubs across government schools of meghalaya and uh, we have had very limited success with that association but uh, they are our partners over there uh, other than that no, none yeah i believe there would be uh, like a huge potential here because nss activities are kind of mandatory at least in colleges at least for the first year second year etc so that's a great suggestion resource, yeah uh, to get into this yeah actually we haven't explored nss at all yeah thanks for the suggestion thank you yeah maybe on that note uh, let me thank you geeta very much uh, it's been a fascinating thanks evening so and uh, as always very insightful and i i'd also request our head anand if he just like to propose a vote of thanks and say a final few words before we wrap up yeah yeah uh, thank you so much uh, first of all may, maybe i should thank pankaj first for uh, bringing uh, a resourceful uh, speaker to this forum as always and then uh, my sincere regards to stuff for uh, this uh, interesting talk and then i suppose it will create interest i mean we had uh, kind of initiated uh, only pankaj had initiated activity where we can uh, bridge the gap between students and uh, because iit also has a very good natural resource here so uh, taking students close to trees and birds uh, he initiated an activity and then covid happened and then we we are stuck in our own places but i hope uh, once the normalcy comes we can resume that kind of activity and uh, these kind of Uh, for i can definitely engage uh, because students have a lot of in- enthusiasm to do variety of things so i think it can be a good win win situation because they will also learn and then uh, we can have a collective wisdom about uh, how things are changing or otherwise so thank you so much for finding time and giving this talk to us and maybe uh, whenever uh, time allows please do visit sitara in iit bombay Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you so much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed interacting with everyone here. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye.